Michael Simbritz from Lund University. Yes. You're an expert on this. Thank you very much and welcome. Do I, um, Daniel, can you help with the presentation? Thanks. So, <clears throat> the international state of the art of eliminating pharmaceutical residues by wastewater treatment. Uh, it's an interesting and also demanding title uh, to carry the burden of state of the art in 15 minutes. I don't know, we'll see. Uh, I just want to point out that the focus in our study was the international perspective, not the national. That will be covered tomorrow, I think, in tomorrow's session. Just as interesting, just so you know. But when working with this study, I came across two short papers, viewpoint papers, that I like to suggest as reading tips. This one comes from British British research team as a reaction to what is happening in Switzerland when they have where they have decided to upgrade a number of, of wastewater treatment plants. And they ask, could there be unintended consequences associated with wastewater treatment upgrades? Think before you act. And of course, you didn't have to wait long until you get a response from Switzerland. And they say that uncertainty is not an excuse for inaction. And if you want to follow this drama, I think it's really worth reading. It's like two pages in each paper, and it gives you some interesting arguments on, on how to reason about the need for advanced treatment. But in our study, this is sort of uh, our basis. If the answer is action at the wastewater treatment plants, what can be done in terms of advanced treatment and what have been done in full scale in different countries? And um, I just realized advanced treatment, when I was taking my first course in wastewater engineering, advanced treatment, that was elimination or reduction of phosphorus and nitrogen. And now we're talking about micropollutants. And that, when I read, thought about that, I realized that I'm getting older. Um, anyways, advanced treatment. And all of this will be summarized or is summarized in a coming report that you can, I think, download quite soon. Um, and it's called Rening från Läkemedelsrester och andra mikroföroreningar, en kunskapssammanställning, a compilation of knowledge. This is based on literature studies. We did a study trip to Switzerland, Germany, looking at advanced treatment in full scale. What are the driving forces? Why have they installed full scale treatment, advanced treatment? What are the technologies that they are using? the implications. What process configurations are they looking at? What have they really gone for? And what, what does it cost? And, and I have a lot of co-authors to thank. And we have, I think, three of them here today. Evelina, Marinette, and Susanne. So there are several of us. You can ask questions if you want to. So uh, what is advanced treatment? Sometimes we see it described as the fourth treatment step. And we're beyond BUD, N, and phosphorus in order to remove micropollutants. But what is full-scale treatment? Is a large enough pilot a full-scale treatment? Of course it is for a small wastewater treatment plant. But our starting point was that, regardless of it's a, like it's a small treatment plant or a big treatment plant, we, we, we decided to take this um, plant in if it was a treatment of the full flow, or at least the dry weather flow on a more permanent basis. That was our sort of uh, basis for the study. So driving forces. Why have they installed this in Germany, Switzerland, and a few other countries? If you remember the, one of the first slides from Joachim Larsson, I think you will recognize the negative effects in the aquatic environment, but also protection of drinking water resources. Even if this is not perhaps considered, as you mentioned, as acute in many cases, it's often mentioned as a very strong driving force. Maybe, uh, well, that's like a separate discussion, but it's often mentioned in several papers as perhaps the strongest driving force. But there are others. We have the importance of or need for end of pipe solutions. True or false, but it's often mentioned. We need to do something end of pipe or downstreams. So, just a few words about our wastewater treatment plants as they are today. What happens? What can we do? 
conventional wastewater treatment with nitrogen removal. Uh, some substances, they will be very well removed, and some substances, just like the diclofenac that I pointed out, will not be removed at all. So it depends on what substances we are talking about. But couldn't we optimize this? Couldn't we do something with the biological treatment? Well, uh, several substances, they cannot today be removed through conventional biological treatment. Uh, if we increase the sludge age, we will promote, promote removal of some substances, but not all of them. And compared to activated sludge, like Anders mentioned, suspended biofilm carriers, they result in higher removal capacity for some substances. But the question goes back to um, what substances do we want to remove, should we remove, and to what degree, obviously. And we don't really have maybe the answer to that. But, and this is important, biological treatment is really crucial to successful integration of advanced treatments because it's an integration of this fourth treatment step to the existing treatment plants. And we need the biological treatment to uh, keep the doses of ozone or powdered activated carbon, for example, as low as possible. We'll talk a little bit about Switzerland now and the conditions for advanced treatment technologies at municipal wastewater treatment plants. Um, they said that a broad spectrum of substances should be removed. Non-wanted transformation products or rest products, they should be avoided. And the basic function, as it is today, of the wastewater treatment plant uh, mustn't be negatively affected, the removal of phosphorus, nitrogen, and organic matter. And the measures, costs, energy, should be justified. We have some principal, principal methods for upgrading. We will not go into detail. It's just important to point out that there are some, I mean, fundamental differences. We can separate substances, for example, by utilizing activated carbon. Or we can go for a transformation of substances, for example, with ozonation. Or we could combine methods. In Switzerland, another reading tip, it's in German, but with an English abstract that is well worth, well worth reading. They said that ozonation and powdered-activated powder -activated carbon are the most cost-effective measures, the technologies that we should go for. But they are also mentioning granular activated carbon filtration as a possible uh, future technology. And uh, what have they said? Well, they say that wastewater treatment plants are significant sources of micropollutants, not so controversial perhaps. Selected plants should be upgraded about 100 during a period of 25 years. Ozonation and activated carbon, like I said, most suitable and cost effective. And they say that treatment of micropollutants will result in significant improvements of water quality, also downstreams in Germany, for example. Large treatment plants will be upgraded to reduce the total loading. That involves more than 50% of the population. Treatment plants designed for at least 24,000 population equivalents will be upgraded to protect certain lakes, drinking water resources. And some smaller treatment plants will be designed because they have sensitive recipients with insufficient dilution. So they have a new law from this year and it says that 80% of certain indicator substances should be removed, and they compare the influent with the effluent. And uh, those substances, they are not affected by biological treatment. I realize it will be hard for you to see, but they have 12 substances divided into two groups. And most of them are pharmaceuticals. Diclofenac, of course, citalopram, uh, there are a few, few ones here. You, you can choose a number of substances from the first group and a, new, uh, and a few substances from the second group. And if you want to read more about this, there's another paper I suggest for reading. Not a single equation, but very interesting in describing the situation in, 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 Switz in Switzerland and why they have come to those decisions. 
So a short introduction to the technologies. There will be more tomorrow if you are interested. Ozonation. Typically, biologically treated wastewater goes into the ozonation with a low content of total organic carbon or dissolved organic carbon. And it's pointed out in several papers that maybe we shouldn't talk about removal of substances, but rather transformation of substances. And this calls for the whole dis discussion of whether we create, or the ozonation creates, metabolites that are unwanted. And therefore, a biological post-treatment is recommended. Uh, toxicity is not my main task. We have people in here knowing, who knows much more about this than I do. But from most of the studies that I have read, it's like the general conclusion would be that toxicity normally reduces, is reduced by ozonation. But there are also studies indicating a more complex picture. The biological post-treatment, what could that be? Most often a sand filter is mentioned. It could be an MBBR, it could be activated carbon. It could also be integrated with upstream processes in interesting ways, like it will be done in Lin Shoping. Um, here's a picture from the first full-scale ozonation plant in Switzerland, in Neugut, in the Zurich area. And it could be interesting to see that the um, ozonation plant, it doesn't take much space. We have the ozone reactor up here and the oxy oxygen tanks here. And by the way, you have people living quite close to this plant, which is a bit different from the Swedish situation. The other way, powdered activated carbon. Again, biologically treated water in order to have a low content of organic carbon. And then we add this as a powder. We need a certain contact time half an hour or so, and then separation of the carbon with the adsorbed pollutants. Here the question might be, especially when compared to Swedish circumstances where we have an ambition of returning sludge to farmland, um, how could we solve this in a Swedish context? Because in Switzerland and Germany, sludge goes to incineration. Ulmerverfahren, this is something I can tell you about more tomorrow. That's the most common practice uh, for, for integrating powdered activated carbon. Granular activated carbon, increased interest for this as a standalone or in combination with ozone. Just a few short words about energy use. Yes, energy use will increase at the plant. Ozonation something like 0 0.1 kil kilowatt hours per cubic meter, depending on the study you look at, and depending upon a number of other factors and the existing infrastructure. Pack a much lower energy use at the plant, but on the other hand, you have the production of pack, which is energy intensive. Costs. Looking at some German, Swiss, and also Dutch study, um, you have somewhat various starting points, which makes those comparisons a little bit difficult, tricky. Uh, what flow, the infrastructure you have, do you include post-treatment or not? Um, but it seems like it's somewhere in the order of 0 0.1 to 0 0.3 euros per cubic meter of treated water, just to give you an indication. And uh, the larger the plant, uh, the lower the cost, relatively speaking. In the report, you will have, and also in tomorrow's session, some more practical examples, pictures, what, what does it look like when you do this in full scale, both from Switzerland and Germany. Also some internet resources that are actually quite good from Switzerland and Germany, where you can follow the development of the new plants that are under planning, in the planning stage or in, under construction. And also, it's actually like that, that we have more plants in Germany than in Switzerland, by the way, in the Baden-Württemberg area and in North Rhine-Westfalen. But it's not only in Switzerland and Germany. There are single plants in France, the ne Netherlands, and there are also very interesting examples on, on reuse and reclamation of, of wastewater, where I think we can learn a lot when looking at those 
sort of treatment solutions, treatment combination. In Japan, we have also nation at more than 60 wastewater treatment plants. Obviously, we can learn something from them as well. The world's largest ozonation plant is under construction in Montreal, and that's a big one. And what is really interesting is that they will ozonate the water that is not biologically treated. It's just what we would call direct felling or pre-precipitation -pre process. So that will be relatively high doses. The process jigsaw, I think we'll save that for tomorrow because my time is almost up. But before finishing, uh, like I said, I'd like to thank my co-authors, Svensk Vatten, Hafsa Vatten, Myndigheten, but most of all, I think our hosts in Switzerland and Germany, they have been really, really helpful during our stay at EAVAG and, and uh, the Emscher Genossenschaft, Lippeverband and Rolfverband. So, um, and they are really interested in what's happening also here in Sweden to follow that development. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mikael. Uh, any questions from the audience to Mikael? Uh, yes, Bengt. <clears throat> when you when you met these people, have have there been any any uh, criticism from from any stakeholder in the in the municipality or in the regions on on that these advanced treatment technologies were installed and uh, if there has been any criticism wh how has that debate kind of uh, went back and back and through um, that's a good question um, we were discussing I mean some obvious factors like energy use it, I mean, we will increase energy use quite a lot by, or in relative terms at least, by introducing this. But uh, in Switzerland, I mean, I got the impression, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, that there was like the majority, they were in favor, because I think they also made this public consultation, if I remember it correctly. And, and I think most people, they were actually in favor of, of this, and, and they said that this is, this is worth the effort, and it's worth the money. So that was the indication that we got from Switzerland. And if you go to the literature, you can see, well, some arguments for and some arguments against. But in Switzerland, at least, that was the case that they were in favor of this. OK, thank you very much. And we have another question. Yes, one question is in regards to the costs that you showed Point one to point yes three euro per cubic meter does that include investment and operational costs and the other question is uh, the interest in the solution with GAC uh, I think you said it's sort of uh, uh, interest is coming up again I would say is that new like the has, half last half year or something because I had uh, got the impression that the GAC there's not much interest in the GAC but maybe that's coming up again um, my impression is that um, GAC has been considered as expensive too expensive but um, maybe it doesn't have to be that expensive in comparison and also I think the combination perhaps of ozonation and GAC as a post-treatment could be really competitive and interesting for several reasons. So um, my impression was that they are really interested in GAC as well. But PAC and ozonation was pointed out and has been before as the two sort of main options. My impression, I guess it depends on who you talk to. <laughs> but I think the interest in GAC could be that, I mean, if you have your doubts about ozonation, and the transformation of substances. Activated carbon and the principal idea of separation of those substances that makes PAC and GAC interesting. Costs, yes, both are, include, are included, yes. 
Okay. Uh, thank you very much, Michael. Great.